Um, yes, I, I think it's. Um, I was very glad that Dr. Nani talked about person centered care, uh, caregiver care, because what I'm going to talk about is really more from a system perspective on universal access to integrated uh, person centered palliative care. Um, I think from, from my own background, because I started life as a clinician and then went on to manage the Hong Kong's health system, uh, and I'm now an academic. And through my career, obviously, I've seen a lot of problems in terms of the provision of uh, care to patients who needed it, and especially, particularly in palliative care. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the challenges, the mechanisms, and the tools uh, in, in, in for, for universal uh, access to care. Uh, next slide, please. The challenges uh, uh, both in terms of demand, uh, yeah. demographic changes, we yeah. have a much uh, longer run expectancy. Of course, uh, we're all familiar with the epidemiological transitions and the the problems of chronic non-communal diseases, and of course, with that, the demands for palliative care because of advanced disease. Uh, next one. In terms of uh, non-communal diseases, uh, this, this is uh, something that is uh, occurring all over the world. That um, the first 41 million people every year, and there are 15 million people who die from NCDs, including the ages of 30 to 69. And many of these uh, premature deaths occur not just in high income countries, but also in low and middle income countries. And of course, with this, with the premature deaths, uh, the detection, screening, and treatment of NCDs, as well as palliative care, the key components. The challenges. Um, next one. Next slide, please. So this, these are figures about uh, non uh, NCDs uh, in in, uh, in Hong Kong, and you can see that the problem is not just one. I think Dr. Lani talked about having multiple. Uh, the um, the deep the deeper colours. Are uh, people having two, three, four, and five, six chronic diseases? So it's one ages when you're in your 70s in Hong Kong. On the average, 25% of people get uh, have three chronic diseases. Next one, please. Next. WHO then talks about this uh, framework for healthy aging options across life course. And towards the later part of life, obviously, it's important to provide support, support capacity enhancing behaviors, ensure a dignified late life, uh, manage the balance point conditions, and remove barriers to participation. And so this applies obviously for NCDs and for palliative care. Uh, next slide. The other aspect of challenges of our health system are the way that we provide health services in terms of the supply. Um, in, in, in the supply of health services, uh, we have problems in terms of advances in our medical knowledge, creating uh, a lot of organization complexity in how we provide care. We need to have continuity and coordination of uh, service to, to our patients. And then obviously with specialization, we need collaboration and coordination, uh, which uh, Dr. Lani talked about uh, earlier, the coordination between uh, geriatrics and, and uh, oncology. But it's, it's really across all the different disciplines. Next one. When you look at how we deliver care in, in, in our systems. And this, of course, uh, it is in all over the world. It's just a matter of how we organize it. We provide care by levels of care, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary care. And we diff we also have different types of care. We have self-care, preventive care, acute, sub-acute, rehabilitative, long-term care, palliative, traditional medicine. Uh, next one, please. And we, we provide care in different settings and facilities, in centers, in hospitals, in daycare clinics, in rehabilitation facilities, in outreach services, community health centers. Next one. And this is how we look, how our healthcare delivery system looks like. We, we, we organize healthcare by primary, second, specialty, and social care. But when we actually deliver it, it's not in these uh, very, very clear uh, boxes. It it, uh, it it is provided uh, in, in community care, in social care. And of course, patients need to access all of these types of care, sometimes at the same time. Of course, the problems of availability, accessibility, affordability, and acceptability is uh, creates a lot of problems. 
And of course, these needs and demands arise from different needs. And during our life course, as I said at the bottom, we in early on, it's more important to have promotion and prevention. And later on in life, it's chronic disease management, palliative care. However, we still need to have disease prevention and we also deal with episodic illnesses. So the complexities of our, the way that we now provide care creates a lot of problems for people who need care, particularly for, for individuals who need um, palliative care. Uh, next slide. When we look at coordinates of healthcare, we need to coordinate for individuals. For, we need to coordinate providers. We need to provide services. We need to coordinate care. Next one. Uh, we also need to, to, to uh, coordinate care for individuals, for groups and, and in clusters and populations. Next one. In coordination of care for an episode of illness, for disease costs, multiple illnesses over a life course. Next one. And we also need to coordinate between public and private providers, between public health and care services and health and social services. And, and uh, coordination between primary, secondary, tertiary care, acute chronic rehabilitative and uh, palliative care, professional and self care. Next one. So you see, we have uh, a big challenges in the way that we need to provide care, coordinate care for operations uh, across different array of specialties. Uh, between professional self-care, between public and private providers, different geographic locations. Next slide. So WHO recommends this concept of integrated health services. So these are services that are managed and delivered in a way that ensure people receive a continuum of health promotion, disease prevention, diagnosis, treatment, disease management, rehabilitation and palliative care, at different levels and sites of care within the health system, according to their needs and throughout their life course. This is obviously a, an aspiration, but in actual effect, in reality, when we try to, to integrate it, it becomes uh, quite a challenge. Next one. There are many approaches to integration. You can then take it between organizations, between clinical and service departments, between organizations. You can join up primary and community care. Uh, it can be real or virtual. It may, may be involve providers collaborating, but also in terms of, uh, integration between purchasers and providers, uh, and, and uh, can bring responsibility between uh, purchasers and providers. So there are many, many approaches to integration. Obviously, the, uh, many of them have got to be done in, in, in parallel uh, in order to achieve the integrated care that patients need and, and uh, want. Next one. So person-centered, people-centered care, which uh, uh, Dr. Lani already gave a, a description, is a, a, an approach that, that uh, adopts the perspective of individuals, families, and communities, and see them as participants as well as beneficiaries that respond to their needs and preferences in human and holistic ways. And they're organized around health needs and expectations of people rather than disease, and, and requires that people have education and support to make decisions to participate in their own care. And person, person -centered, people centered care is, um, is particularly relevant to palliative care because there cannot be palliative care without dealing with the person's, understanding the person's needs and practices. Yeah. So, this is the um, next one. Next slide. Yeah, the, the, uh, the figure. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the model of, the, of person centered care, that you have the, the health sector governance and financing to enable it. You need to have delivery networks, and obviously you need to have the person within the family, the community, and other sectors uh, that support it. Uh, next one. So the benefits are obviously is, is very obvious. It improves access and timeliness of care. There's shared decision-making involvement in the care planning, both for the individual, the families, and the community. Next one. So I move on to, to uh, palliative care in particular. Uh, this is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, WHO defines palliative care as an approach to improve the quality of life for patients and their families, facing problems associated with life-threatening illnesses, to prevention and relief of suffering, and treatment of pain, and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. Next slide. But when you look at long-term care, it's really very similar. 
His medical support support needed to obtain optimal levels of physical, social, and psychological functioning by a person who are fairly independent. And obviously, there's a lot of overlap. And in palliative care, the key part is obviously the involvement of the of the patient and the families, and the life-threatening illness, and the, the need to provide the spiritual care. And I think spirituality is something which is uh, quite important for palliative care. But it's something that we don't do uh, very well with uh, in our in, in providing creative care in many places. Uh, spirituality very often is pretty much left to chaplains or religious organizations. But spirituality uh, is, uh, is is defined has been defined as um, as uh, as a journey of self discovery, a search for the sacred, for meaning, and for the purpose of life. It's about the person's total existence. Uh, spirituality can be perceived as existential or religious, but it can be defined by individuals seeking and expressing meaning and purpose and the way they experience their connectedness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature, and to the significant or sacred. It's unique to each person. And this is the key part of, uh, of being a human being, the, of, of uh, a person. Uh, and this, this embodies the importance of, of uh, the spirituality that's needed in, in palliative care, uh, because the, the 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 people describe uh, physical, emotional, uh, psychological pain, but in fact there is also spiritual distress, and and where there is a disruption of the individual's belief in their own value systems. Of course, when when people talk about uh, when 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 in in many of the illnesses that we cannot cure, we can still heal. And you, you heal by dealing with the spirituality of the individual. And I think that's the essence to me of palliative care. Of course, it, it's, it needs to be provided early on, not very much later. Because when, when, when the person is told that they have a life threatening illness, a cancer, uh, they, 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 there's a threat to their, their belief in their value systems. So, so even before they, 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 they are being investigated, or they are offered uh, different treatments. Uh, the spiritual needs, the spiritual distress, is already uh, there. But we we do not recognize that. I think in, in many of our systems, we only think about spirituality at towards the end of life. But spirituality, spiritual needs occur throughout our life course. It's just that when there, we have blood treating illnesses, it just uh, uh, highlights the need for us to address it. Next slide. So this is a, an interesting paper uh, about rethinking terms of care for chronic diseases. Uh, it, it looks into the different facets and components which I've been talking about. It looks at um, uh, for people with chronic diseases that you need to look at uh, their needs, their, their needs for rehabilitation, resilience, well-being, their leisure, their, their primary food care. They need to have uh, communities of passion, of compassion. They need to um, have engagement with persons with, with NCD and, and those important to them, advanced care planning, quality of life in, in the community, in society, education and training programs, healthcare systems and healthcare policies. So this is one, one model uh, that uh, has been put forward to look at how we provide palliative care for people with uh, advanced uh, chronic disease. Next slide. The major talks about universal health coverage as ensuring all people have access to needed promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative health services, uh, sufficient quality, be effective, and do not suffer financial hardship while paying for these services. Next slide. So the concept of universal health coverage, because this is part of the, the policy enabling for people to have access to palliative care, uh, uh, is looking at these this cubic in terms of how we can. Uh, uh, expand access to services and interventions, improve quality, advance equity, provide financial protection, optimize efficiency, and improve outcomes. It's only when one deals with it that we're able to provide universal coverage for access to all the needed services that people require. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. The, 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 uh, there's a situation analysis that one can do for look at you to achieve the use of your coverage within the healthcare system, the financing organization, the mechanisms, 
the governance arrangement for future purchasing, availability of and patterns of health facilities and, and health workers, availability of medicines and technology. Looking at demographic variables, including population growth, the geographic distribution, the scope of social safety nets, and economic impact of illness and impacts on, on reducing financial barriers in accessing services, and relevant aspects of public sector administration and legal framework. So this provides a good framework in terms of when you want to provide better access uh, to needed care, including palliative care. Next one. I started by talking about the the uh, the mechanisms, uh, how we aim to provide greater access to integrated palliative care. And we see the first part of the of the uh, of the model needs to do with screening to identify patients with potential palliative care needs, because uh, many of the palliative care needs are provided uh, very late in, in in trajectory of people's illness. But as as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are palliative care needs even very early on in, in um, the diagnosis of many uh, life threatening diseases, even before uh, one, one, one provides uh, uh, supportive care. So, even in the curative uh, stage, uh, palliative care is needed. So, there's a lot of uh, mis, um, uh, misunderstanding and mis misconceptions, even among the, um, uh, the health professionals. The palliative care is provided only towards the end of life, uh, when when uh, when palliative care uh, is is uh, is no longer viable. Uh, palliative care can be can be provided and should be provided uh, together with the palliative care, depending on the needs of the So first, is screen uh, have a, a good screening tool to, for patients with potential palliative care needs. And the next step, uh, which I'm uh, talk about. Is assessment of the palliative care needs, uh, which uh, depends on the preferences and uh, the understanding of the individual in terms of uh, the, the mean the things that are valued to them, uh, the, the person's uh, value systems are important. And after having accessed that, then uh, one needs then to plan services uh, that meet the, the person's needs and preferences, and then service matching, which uh, is uh, matched to the, those needs and coordination. Of course, this is the other uh, complex issue. How do we actually provide the ongoing uh, service required? Because it changes with time. So the, the person's trajectory changes, uh, as uh, we know very well that one cannot predict the end of life. Uh, although although there are mechanisms to to um, estimate, but uh, individual patients is is never very predictive. Right? So, so the needs change uh, with the person's uh, illness trajectory. And I think Dr. Lani also showed a slide just now that the, the, the tra trajectory is not linear, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, people improve, they deteriorate, uh, their, their, their needs change, uh, the, the, the physical needs change, not just physical, but their, their psychological and spiritual needs also changes uh, with, with the illness trajectory. And of course, the last step is to evaluate uh, to optimize achievements, goals, and outcomes. So this is would be the uh, at the clinical level, but this can only be uh, provided if there's coordination of clinical care, and then we have an integrated healthcare delivery system, which I already talked about. And then we need to have enabling health system policies uh, for univ universal health coverage. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>